I, I don't know Australia so well, but you know, in the United States, that there there are many states where there still is a majority that is um, that is sufficiently conservative, so that a, an alliance could be built to say, look, we we we've we've had enough of of liberal democracy. We want conservative democracy. We want a, a democracy that uh, focuses on uh, preservation and restoration, and therefore can serve as a model for others. Yeah. Uh, how uh, of how things might be done, but conservatives have to be willing to do it. They have to be willing to uh, to take political risks in order to uh, to have more conservative government where it's feasible uh, democratically. Yoram Hazani is president of the Herzl Institute in Jerusalem. He currently serves as chairman of the Edmund Burke Foundation which is a public affairs institute based in Washington. His book, The Virtue of Nationalism, was an Amazon number one bestseller in both international diplomacy and nationalism. He has a doctorate in political theory from Rutgers University. He's written for or appeared on many media outlets, including The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, Fox News, CNN, The Ben Shapiro Show, Prager U and the Rubin Report. Dr. Hazoni's latest book is Conservatism, a Rediscovery, and he will unpack a great deal of what he means by conservatism and why it is valuable, even though it's now so often mocked in this conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Yaron, thank you so much for joining us. Can we begin by talking about your book, The Virtues of Nationalism? What is nationalism? I don't think it's a very well understood term today. And how different is it to patriotism? Nationalism is a, a principled standpoint that uh, sees that sees or proposes that the world is governed best when many different nations have the right to chart their own course. So na nationalism uh, looks to a world of independent nations rather than you know, say a uh, uh, a global order under a single er empire or multiple 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 empires. And with regard to patriotism, I'd say the two things are very similar. I mean, in general, when we use the the term patriotism, we're speaking about the way we feel, uh, you know, towards our own country or our own our own homeland. So, you know, someone in Australia would be uh, an Australian patriot uh, if uh, if he loves it. He loves Australia, and if he's proud of Australia and is willing to uh, fight to secure the freedom of Australia, uh, the term nationalism is uh, it, it's uh, it can be used that way, but it's also used uh, in the sense uh, of a a political theory, you know, a, a theory of world order that says um, if if each nation has its independence, then we're better off. So na nationalism, I would say, is you know, is the the opposite of imperialism, the opposite of a theory that says, uh, how do we get um, peace and prosperity in the world? Well, by uniting everyone under a single rule of law. Okay, well, there's a lot to explore here, but let's first um, tackle the problem that I think many young people would be very dubious because they've been taught, particularly, I guess, in academia, that nationalism is somehow a, a dirty word connotating fascism, racism, violence. Um, you point out in your book that only a century ago, even so-called um, progressives praised nationalism as both just and liberating. Why have we moved so quickly from seeing nationalism and your identity as an Australian or an Israeli or as a Brit or as an American or as a Japanese person? Uh, why you know, was it praised so recently and then it's now fallen into such disrepute in the public mind. Well, th there's uh, an un undeniable historical fact, which is that uh, that uh, uh, Adolf Hitler adopted the word nationalism as his description of his, you know, biological race-based world-dominating imperialism. Right. So if you if you pick up Mein Kampf, which I don't recommend, but if you if you actually read it. Uh, you, you'll see that Hitler never says that 
you know, what he wants to do is to is to build a world German empire. He says that Germany should be the mistress of the globe and the lord of the earth, uh, but he calls that nationalism. And uh, in the in the wake of the Second World War, um, liberals and Marxists who were hostile to the idea of independent nations uh, adopted her uh, um, uh, adopted this terminology of uh, of Hitler's and said, "Look, either you're a liberal or you're uh, this terrible thing that that's a nationalist is what what Hitler was." But the the, the problem. This is, you know, aside from the fact that I'm not terribly interested in learning political theory from Hitler, is that um, we have a, I mean, th there's this pattern that that the left is constantly jumping at opportunities to uh, make uh, words that conservatives use to describe their positions illegitimate. You know, so so we we have the same problem with. Uh, you know, with conservatism, which is associated with fascism, we have the same problem with, you know, with religion, with Christianity or Judaism, which are, you know, said said to always refer to uh, to something terrible. Um, any any term that is important to people who want to conserve and preserve things ends up being uh, tainted and turned into something evil. So, you know, look, th there's certainly. Um, bad nationalists and good nationalists, just like there are, you know, bad and good uh, Christians and Jews and virtually anything else that you can think of. But uh, we do have to take a position on the question of whether we believe that the independence of nations, the the sovereignty of nations, their right to chart their own course, is a value that that uh, that we, as a general matter, approve of. Uh, and if we do, if we do approve of national independence as a way of ordering the political world, then we need a word for it. And there is no other word. So, um, you know, people could invent some word, but at the moment, nationalism is what we have. It's a little outdated now, but we had uh, the, the the shock of Brexit and then, uh, then the, the Trump um, surprise in America. Both of them seem to contain an element of, of ordinary Brits and ordinary Americans saying, hey, we don't like what's happening to our country. And David Goodhart, of course, talks about the somewheres and the anywheres. Yes. The somewheres were the Brits who still had a sense, would you say, of nationalism. The anywheres were the people who, wealthy, sophisticated, global village, able to move around, no longer felt that are, their British identity or their American identity or their Australian identity mattered. They saw themselves as global citizens. Yes, yeah, I, I, I think that's a, that's that's a very good description. Um, th there is an aspect of this which has to do with um, where do your loyalties lie. So it, you know, if a in a traditional uh, tra traditional Western nationalist or or, or, or non-Western nationalist would say, you know, my my loyalties lie, uh, my political loyalties lie with you know with with my country, with my nation. I wish others well. Uh, I, I if I can, maybe I'll help others get their independence. But uh, but uh, that sentiment of of uh, of being uh, loyal loyal to your country as you as your first political loyalty. Um, that that is exactly what was uh, stirring again, both in the Trump movement and with Brexit, uh, and we've uh, uh, seen it elsewhere. We see it in in Maloney's uh, Italy, in uh, uh, or, uh, Orbán's Hungary. But in addition to that, there's you know the, there are countries like uh, India and Israel, uh, which uh, uh, where nationalism was always a positive. Word because they gained their independence through uh, through wrestling with uh, uh, with the British Empire, and um, these uh, the, the these sem sentiments never really disappeared. You know, so uh, I'm Israeli, and we certainly do have uh, in Israel a uh, you know a, 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 a small segment of uh, of the educated elites who think in these terms of let's eliminate all the borders and uh, and. Uh, by doing so, we we will end all all independent nations, and we'll end all wars, and we'll reach utopia. But the overwhelming majority of uh, you know of Israelis, when they see 
the Trump movement or Brexit, um, you know, they may may support support or not support different elements of it, but the the general thrust of saying we don't want a world government, we're not looking to be ruled by uh, anything like the uh, the European Union or the United Nations, but we want to we want self rule, we want to rule ourselves. That that's kind of you know the central traditional political outlook. So um, the drift towards this view that says that the globe faces such serious challenges, uh, peace, justice, climate responsibility, you do get this sort of feeling out of forums like uh, the WEF that meets in Davos every year, the World Economic Forum, that there is a need for a global government now. Uh, I think you would say that um, this would constitute a drift towards imperialism, perhaps, and that the modern expression of that might be globalism, and that it's not good news for individual flourishing and freedom and prosperity. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I don't think there is, in in principle, any difference between uh, between globalism or the liberal international order or the new world order. All of these are. These are all euphemisms for constructing an empire under a single rule of law, and uh, and and that's in general what we hear from Klaus Schwab and and the supporters of the uh, the the World Economic Forum is that our troubles are so great that we simply can't afford to continue having independent nations. The 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 first problem with this, you know, that 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 you alluded to is that. We don't have any record in human history of uh, of an imperial order that is uh, democratic. That th- th- there appears to be zero possibility of uh, maintaining, uh, you know, the the the, the kinds of um, uh, freedoms that that we are accustomed to under a an imperial order. Now we can. You know, there's different arguments and different ways to understand this, to try to understand this. But the 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 essential problem is that uh, democracy uh, and even liberalism. I, I'm a conservative. I don't uh, I, I don't identify as a liberal, and I don't I don't like liberalism so much. But speaking to people who, you know, who uh, who are liberals, um, uh, or anyone. You know, such as myself, who, who prefers democracy to dictatorship, I I, I think it's important to recognize that uh, democracy and also liberalism are things that flourished under uh, and and grew to be something um, admirable and tolerable uh, only in the framework of independent nations. You know, so if if you if you look at independent Britain, independent. Holland, independent America; um, th- those are the places where the uh, uh, where, where the uh, what we call democracy today uh, had its uh, its flowering. Those are the places where traditions of liberty uh, came into being. And you know the the, the the idea that you could simply impose a world government on free nations um, without giving any thought to the problem of well, how could democracy possibly uh, succeed in that context? I mean, basically, people who are advocating a world government. What they're saying is, let's go back to you know something like the Roman Empire, uh, which uh, which doesn't doesn't have democratic traditions and therefore is um, uh, is forced to use tyranny in order to govern. What's the advantage here? Would one way of looking at it? I'm seeking your views here as a Jewish scholar. Um, I've heard people started to talk again about subsidiarity. That is to say that human flourishing works best in the context of an ordered freedom and you start small with a small platoon. It might be family, might be 10 people. They try and live together cooperatively, resolve their differences, find their way forward. And then you have a pyramid structure. Um, but essentially you, you devolve power as much as possible. You devolve decision-making uh, freedom of choice and those sorts of things as much as possible if you want to maximize the chances of individual human flourishing. 
and globalization is, if you like, or has tended in precisely the opposite direction, more and more tops down interference with the way people will live, therefore less and less personal autonomy. Right. There's 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 two different issues here, and they stand in intention with one another. The um, the subsidiarity point, um, you know, which is also reflected in in uh, uh, in Anglo American traditions of federalism. It's r- roughly the same concept: is that it is that uh, government is best when it's devolved towards you know, downward towards the people who have a stake in it. People have different local uh, traditions, and those traditions um, carry wisdom, uh, hard-earned historical wisdom with them. And you you want as much as possible uh, to allow localities and regions uh, to to maintain you know their own customs and their own laws and their own way ways of doing things. So this is this is a you know a point that is kind of uh, broadly accepted by. Uh, by 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 people across many different um, uh, schools of political thinking, the problem is that there is there's an additional aspect that you have to balance against this, which is that in in uh, in a world in which uh, there's competition among nations and competitions among states, some of them are you know very aggressive and uh, have imperial ambitions. In that kind of a world, and I and I don't I don't see any likelihood that we'll be in a different kind of world. In that kind of competitive world, you also need a center that's strong enough to be able to uh, maintain um, both a, a, a strong defensive posture against encroachments from, you know, from other countries uh, or from empires, and also to be able to um, maintain a, uh, a cohesion and a unity among the different uh, the different parts of the nation. I mean, there, there, there are no, there's no such thing as a homogenous nation. All, all nations are, uh, uh, are, are, are made up of tribes and sectors that have different interests and different ways of looking at things. And so, uh, the, the, the purpose of the, uh, of the center, the national center, or the federal center, the, the, the purpose of these, these, uh, of a strong central government is, is twofold on the one hand to make sure that uh that you can defend your independence against and your way of life against threats from other countries and especially from from uh from uh ambitious empires and on the other hand that you know someone actually needs to be responsible for uh dealing with issues of uh of uh, justice among different groups within you know within your federation within your alliance so, you know, if uh, you have uh, wise and responsible people in charge of the central government, and obviously, you know, not all central national governments are wise and responsible, but uh, but but the aim of a, a wise and responsible central government, in addition to defending the country, uh, is to uh, look out for um, uh, for trouble trouble within the country. To try to understand the you know the interests of competing groups and the the demands that they're making and the things that are uh, are are upsetting them, and to uh, to find an appropriate balance so that a you know a peaceful and mutually loyal um, uh, uh, mutually loyal uh, political arrangement can continue through time, and th- there's no I I don't see any. I don't see any way of doing without national government for for those purposes. Two of our longest serving and most respected prime ministers, at least two, were fond of making the point that the things that unite us are far more important and enduring than the things that divide us. And that reflects, I think, that balance. Yes. Uh, but, and we, but we'll come back to the threat of identity politics in a moment. Before we do... I have um, long had a deep interest in the business of lifting people out of hunger and out of poverty. And I would say the four ingredients in the incredible progress we've made over the last 50 years have been uh, research, the making a, the available of uh, the making that research available. Think the green revolution throughout Asia uh, that lifted so many people out of hunger. Um, 
uh, I would say, a liberal rules-based order so that as farmers develop a bit of product, they can sell it and it goes on up the chain uh, and available uh, and affordable energy. They're the four things. Um, Globalisation, I suppose, in the, as, in, as part of that subset, has had its benefits in lifting people out of poverty. It now has a very bad name indeed, and we've, you've just, you know, very well articulated some of the dangers of globalisation if it starts, if you like, to do away with our differences and our legitimate cultural and national interests. How do we get that balance right? Because not everything about globalisation has been bad, and yet, as you say, it's gone so far down the road that responsible citizens everywhere are now starting to say, hang on, there's a limit to this. Yeah, I'm, I, I wouldn't use the word globalization to, to describe um, mutually beneficial trade arrangements. See, it, it, the, there's, no, there's no obstacle to the cooperation between, among independent nations where they uh, see mutual interests. The, the the problem with the with the globalist theory or or the, let's 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 call it the liberal international order or the rules based liberal order these are you know uh, terms that that are uh, frequently used by you know the advocates of these the system themselves the the problem is that as long as you're talking about um, independent nations people are committed to independent nations. And to uh, to trade trade agreements and and uh, uh, other other measures like you, you know uniform technical standards uh, agreements that make it possible to uh, to improve mutually beneficial trade. In in that case, everyone's in favor of it. You know, liberals are in favor and conservatives are in favor. Nobody, I, I don't know anyone who's against voluntary uh, arrangements of this kind. The, the 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 thing that it gave, gave me personally a chill for the first time was you know back back in 1990 when uh, George H W Bush began talking about uh, the new world order that uh, that was about to arise in the post soviet era and th that new world order as he described it i mean in that famous speech he he said you know for 100 generations we've been looking for for a way to you know to to put an end to injustice and war in the world and to wrap the entire planet under a single rule of law. And now we've arrived at it. This is going to happen in our generation. Now, people you know, think of, of Bush as a conservative or, or some kind of a moderate, but that, that vision is identical. I mean, it, it's no different in, you know, in any way from, uh, from uh, the, the, the vision of, uh, it, Earlier imperialist liberals like Napoleon, who said, "You know, our uh, our 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 goal is uh, is to unite all all of mankind," and the 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 temptation, which America has has not resisted, is to say, "Well, be, you know, because our rules based international order is for everybody's benefit, uh, that means that we have uh, we have the right, and we have in fact a mission." To uh, to impose it by force on uh, those those peoples who don't don't believe it's in their their interest, and it, that that theory immediately, almost immediately, uh, l led to uh, to uh, interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan and Somalia and Bosnia and and uh, and in Libya and and diplomatic machinations in Egypt i mean the 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 story of these liberal internationalists is not a story of people who believe in the benefits of voluntary uh, trade among nations voluntary cooperation among nations it's a story of people who are convinced that that their view of of international politics is so correct that they should simply impose it by force on anybody who sees things differently and uh, that's more than a small disadvantage to uh, to their theory. I should just just add, with respect to the bringing people out of poverty. I, I mean, who can be against that? I, I'm I'm in favor of it, but um, it needs to be done in uh, in in a way that is that doesn't um, uh, overturn. Uh, the good nations, the the just nations, the successful nations that 
uh, that we have, which are, are, you know, are the ones that are that are leading these improvements for all mankind. Now, the the m- much of the um, uh, improvement of people's lives has taken place in uh, in China, and I, you know, I the, I don't have an, anything against improving people's lives in China, but uh, over you know between 2000 and and you know uh, 2016 when when this uh nationalist reaction began or be, be, between the 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 entry of of China into the World Trade Organization um and the reaction against that I guess it's 15 years what happened is is sure we lifted you know uh, uh tens of millions maybe hundreds of millions of chinese out of poverty but at the expense of having um having industry manufacturing especially leave uh america and europe and other democratic nations and move to china at the time the theory was first of all that this will cause china to to liberalize and become a democracy well that didn't work and and second there was um this kind of a uh, utopian assumption that that you know, if the manuf- manufacturing capabilities uh, leave, they'll be replaced. You know, by uh, by by the uh, the free economic system. That they'll be replaced by other things that are at least as good, at least as beneficial. And that that's also a question at this point. So I I, I think I, I think people are simply becoming you know more realistic. That of you know, of course, we like the people of China to. Um, uh, to to uh, rise out of poverty, but we can't, you know, do it in such a way uh, that uh, that Chinese power becomes uh, comes in, in in place of the power of democratic countries, and we can't do it in such a way that that Chinese employment comes at the uh, at the expense of the employment within democratic countries. So th- there's a, there is a balance to be sought there, and I, I'm not. You know, I'm not sure anybody knows the the right balance. I think people just feel that that we have the wrong balance now. It it might be true to say. Do you think then that we are all posing ourselves that question? We are working through now what yes. to do with globalization. How do we handle the mess? And a part of your answer would be, I think, to say we need to believe in ourselves again as nation states. Uh, that that our, our identity as we seek to preserve the things that are good should center on rebuilding our own societies. Would that be a fair thing to say? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I agree completely. I mean, um, what, what, what I, Western societies are, are not, they're not in, not in good shape. I mean, no. uh, we, we have um, multiple, multiple crises that are, you know, that are in, interlocking uh, that I, I would say they, they they begin with the crisis of uh, of uh, of the family and and the uh, attenuation of uh, religious tradition, which was a central part of uh, of uh, um, maintaining a just society for for you know for centuries, uh, and uh, and then goes onward and upward to the you know the 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 crisis of uh, of um, governments that. Don't understand that they're that that they have a a purpose in first and foremost making sure that their own people are uh, are are well off or, or or at least improving. If you you know in a dem- dem- democratic country, if you're not concerned to um, to make sure that that you know at least most of your people are uh, are, are are satisfied with the way things are going for them. If that's not your concern, then they'll throw you out. And if they uh, start to think, you know, God forbid that uh, that um, that a, a just, democratic, free government is incapable uh, of uh, making sure that things are relatively good or improving for most of the people, then they'll turn against democracy. You know, and and we, we are seeing the 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 beginnings of this. It 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 it, well, we it, are. it you you can't you can't have uh, a consistent uh, and and an elite a governing elite that consistently ignores the interests and well being of their own nation 
without having that nation rebel and that rebellion it might be a you know a democratic rebellion uh, a, a pro freedom rebellion but it also might not be sobering um and you i think gave a talk at yale university not so long ago you made the point that one of the maladies in your view of modern democracy particularly in america is that there's a deficit in nationalism among legislators rather than this very point you've just been making jointly seeking the good of their country regardless of political positions they more often find themselves in conflict working for identity and interest groups can i ask the relationship can you just expand a bit more between nationalism and a healthy democracy sure you've said a bit about it but what were you driving at there well uh, look the um let's start with something very very basic you know when we, when we speak of democracy you know what exactly are we talking about um, we the the concept of democracy as we as we use it now refers to a uh, to a a system in which previously um, warring uh, tribes or or regions that that you know that had very strong mutually hostile identities um, that that were in tension or at war with each other they uh, they come together. And they say, look, let's make a deal. There really is more that unites us than what divides us. Yep. So let's make a deal in which instead of uh, deciding uh, problems amongst us um, through warfare uh, or, or other kinds of, uh, of, of violence, we, we're going to have elections instead. And uh, every four years or every six years or every two years, whatever it is, um, we'll have an election, we'll have a campaign, we'll make arguments. And if you win, I'll be loyal to you. I'll be the loyal opposition. If you win, I'll be the loyal opposition. And I will support you and and enable you to govern, you know, within within limits. But I'll I'll help you make help you gov govern from your perspective. You know, I'm not going to try to you know, force you to to uh, into a condition where the country is dysfunctional and the and the entire system falls. I'll go with you, and on condition that in the next election I get a fair chance to displace you to explain all the mistakes you made, and then you'll support me. You'll be the loyal opposition. Okay, that that that's democracy. That is that's the basis of uh, of democracy. It's bringing together formerly hostile, potentially violently hostile groups under a system of of mutual loyalty now if if you um if you go back to the you know the 1960s or the 1980s and you watch uh debates uh, even in america which is you know uh, america britain are you know both having terrible terrible difficulties with their democracy right now it, it, in israel it's just arrived in israel where where the the the, the democracy that i just described has ceased to function in all of three three of these cases, uh, first in the U.S. and the U.K. in 2016, and now also in Israel. What we're what we're watching is um, one side that lost the election in in, in the U.K. It was the uh, the side that lost Brexit. One side has lost the election, and instead of saying we're the loyal opposition, how can how can we help? They're saying this is not legitimate. We're the resistance, you know, like like you're a dictator, we're the resistance. And in all three cases, the claim that the elected government that the that, that won the election is a dictatorship, that claim is absurd. We, it, it's it's it, it simply false. It's not true. We 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 know what fascists look like. We 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 know what happens when when a political army, uh, a political party takes up takes up arms and begins violence in the streets rather than accepting the results of an election. And the it, the the three cases we're talking about, Trump, Brexit, and the Netanyahu government, none of them have anything to do with, with, with uh, dictatorship or fascism. They're simply conservative governments. So people have, it's, it's legitimate for people to say their policies are terrible. Their personalities are, are loathsome. I don't like them. And I want to, and therefore we have to win the next election. But democracy ends when you say, "I can't wait for the next election. We're gonna we're gonna take this fight to the streets, and we don't we don't care if it's violence. We're gonna make government stop. 
we're, we're going to stop the functioning of this country until you're gone. That that's that's literally the the decision to to uh, to to end democracy. So uh, you you asked uh, about what's the responsibility. Both government and opposition have a responsibility in a democracy to constantly work to build up mutual trust, which is the only basis on which democracy is possible. The opposing parties have to they have to have a a minimal level of trust that allows free elections and uh, and tr and peaceful transitions from one party to another ruling. And we are uh, in in various democratic countries in the West, we are coming to uh, to the end of that. And the only way to turn around uh, is uh, is for both sides to say uh, reestablishing trust is more important than anything else. and uh, and 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 let's talk and and find out how to do that. It seems to me in, uh, that I, I entirely agree with you, the importance of trust. Nothing works without trust. Once you've got two or three people gathered together, if they trust one another, you can move together, become greater than the sum of your parts. The minute you don't and you're looking to your own safety, you're suspicious of the others, cooperation and the chance to work together to seek a better outcome for everyone starts to break down. And in Australia, the Australian National University has been tracking confidence in the federal government the federal parliament now for nearly 60 years and it's been a constant decline it's now reached very low levels and doesn't pick up at the time of elections it used to you'd get an up pick uh, an uplift at the t after an election that's not happening anymore which is very very concerning because trust or a breakdown of trust seems quite contagious and now it seems that identity politics really accelerates that because of the way in which we, we essentially seem to instill in ourselves and in our young people the idea that if somebody else disagrees with you, they are automatically bad people and to be opposed. Yep. And this is feeding this, this tribalism that's the product of identity politics. Yeah, you, you know, I, uh, I, I, I agree with most of that. I, I, want, to, I, I, I want to register a caveat that... Um, the, some of some of the critiques of identity politics and tribalism, so, some of them uh, move in the direction of saying that, uh, implying or sometimes saying that uh, that strong group identities are inherently inherently bad. You know, and as a as a conservative, I I'm skeptical of those kinds of arguments. I think I think that. You know, group, group identities are natural, and uh, and uh, under appropriate circumstances, they're also beneficial. Uh, in a condition in which the different, you know, the, the different the, the different tribal groups, the different cultural groups, the different religious groups in a society, in a condition in which uh, they recognize uh, the the need for to to constantly be be building up mutual trust and and collaboration in the national effort under those conditions um a strong strong group identities can can be very helpful you know i i mean just to pick an example you know one of one example that, that that's close to my heart I, I i find it difficult to understand how people expect to have a strong nation without a strong uh strong uh, religious institutions and um, religious institutions, they, they, you know, they, they, they tend to disagree with one another. And I, I think that if you look at those places, at those, those times and places in which, uh, um, countries like, uh, like, like, uh, uh, America or Britain were strongest, um, there, there, there was a strong church, sometimes multiple strong churches. And also, you know, uh, it, there, there can be toleration for other religions, for, for, for Jews who maintain their own strong identities and then contribute to the society. I, I mean, I, 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 I think it's important not to lose the, those advantages of strong identities. Which allow there to be strong families, a, a, a str strong moral inheritance, a strong a willingness to serve the nation uh, in times of crisis. All of these things have to do; they're related with strong, uh, strong group identities uh, in the subgroups. 
the, the problem with the, the current what's called identity politics today is that again that you know that term is correct but it's also kind of a a euphemism because what is being described is not the traditional um competition among uh, different groups in order to you know advance and gain advantage for for their their people uh, uh in a democratic society identity politics is one possible name for uh for a coherent ideology that uh that i would prefer to identify as a strain of neo marxism and when i when i say that you know that the woke ideology or the or, or the the, the uh, identity politics ideology is a strain of neo marxism i mean this in the in the technical philosophical sense not not in the sense of you know name calling cuz cuz i think that you know that 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 name will tarnish somebody the 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 marxist framework begins with the assumption that the competition among uh, social groups always inevitably involves a dominant group which is the oppressor which is exploiting all of the weaker groups who are the oppressed okay in other words if we if if we assume that wherever there is group rivalry group identities group rivalries if we assume that that it's actually always black and white there's always one oppressor and everybody else is oppressed if you accept that marxist assumption then you move into a new kind of identity politics where instead of the different groups you know each one jockeying for you know for the good of its own group and and coming to some kind of arrangement that's that's mutually beneficial instead of that what you do is you take all of the all of the groups but one and you say well we are intersectional we we all have the same interests what's our interest destroying the strongest group and as soon as you're you know everybody's interest is destroying the strongest group you've come up with a a formula you know first for cultural revolution and then for political revolution um and uh you know i i i honestly don't i i don't believe anything but tyranny ever comes of these uh these uh, marxist fueled revolutions you know regardless if it's mark the traditional marxist or neo marxist it 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 doesn't make any difference the goal of overthrowing the leading the leading figures the leading uh, groups in society and destroying their control by violence if necessary and eliminating them as a force that's it it's both uh, immensely destructive but it's also utopian notice that you know none of these uh, uh these um uh uh identity politics uh, groups none of them have a they're not advancing a plan for you know how the utopia after the revolution is going to work they're not telling us and and they're not telling us in large part because they have no idea they simply want power and power yeah. without power without any kind of you know uh um wisdom or understanding about how power translates into uh, the good of the people is is tyranny beautifully put could we move to um the idea of multiculturalism and by that i mean a state policy that says there should be no dominant culture or program of assimilation into a dominant culture but that the many cultural communities and their distinctiveness should all be celebrated now i agree with you that up to a point you want a vibrant respectful but competitive marketplace of ideas argument about beliefs about values as long as it's always respectful we can agree on that but i wonder whether multiculturalism hasn't been in one sense in some ways a bit of a race to the bottom yes uh, and i'm wondering too whether it's damaged nationalism yes well look multiculturalism is it's yet another one of these academic theories um and you know the, the, there's uh, lots of lots of books on it and some of them are, are very good and very interesting and um and you know the, the uh, as you said the the principle of um 
allowing many different you know cultural strands uh, within the nation, including you know some very divergent st strands, uh, to flourish and and grow strong, uh, is um, look. I I think it's 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 definitely part of a competitive marketplace of ideas, uh, but you know e even even in a country in which um, you know the ru rulers are rulers are autocrats. Um, there still are benefits to um, to uh, allowing various groups to strengthen themselves um, and and to feel that they have freedom and influence uh, without I mean to, to correctly feel that they have freedom and influence without without trying to oppress them and and force them all to be one thing. I, I think it's simply good, regardless of what kind of government you have, and cer certainly in a democracy, um, to uh, to al allow um, the uh, the strengthening of different cultural strands uh, and and uh, and the sub identities that go with them, uh, but again, the problem is uh, that there is a tension here, and the the uh, the argument of the multiculturalists, uh, uh, as you correctly say, uh, too often the academic multiculturalists have simply been hostile to having any kind of uh, dominant culture, any kind of central culture, any kind of um, uh, national interest or concern uh, that the uh, the the diversity um, be part of a greater um, unity, and uh, if if what you're doing is constantly fueling diversity, I mean th this is um, uh, this both has to do with you know cultural educational policy, but it also has to do with uh, with with immigration. Um, immigration can be can be very beneficial in the case in which you have a strong national inheritance and a you know a dominant a dominant tradition a dominant historical tradition a dominant religious tradition uh, a, a, a dominant group with that uh, that is uh, generous and uh, and uh, capable of allowing other things to flourish that that that's that's the best that's the best world the problem is that that when you tilt all the way to the direction again of saying look there is no center it's illegitimate to have one group that's stronger than the others it's uh, illegitimate to think in terms of of uh, of a, a unified national narrative because uh, that kind of education uh, is uh, is inherently oppressive as soon as you say those things then you know what what you're saying is uh, i i don't value the unity of this nation uh, as far as I'm concerned, it can fly apart, and uh, and and I don't care whether the uh, the loss of national unity, um, national cohesion, national mutual loyalty among the different groups. I don't care whether that disappears because uh, its disappearance will mean you know freedom for everybody. Well, it, look, that kind of view. It means the the end of independence because as soon as nations are internally divided to that extent, they're unable to 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 defend themselves against uh, uh, hostile actors that 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 seek to divide them further. In the end, it 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 the the, the outcome is invasion and oppression, uh, or or civil war. So, um, you know, many of the things that are said by the multiculturalists are are simply true. It's just that they're 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 describing. You know, one side of a just and 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 decent independent polity, and they say I, I'll describe fifty percent of the picture, and I'll pretend that that's the whole, and and they hope that that's going to bring again this utopia of everybody doing whatever, every group doing whatever they want with no center, and everything will be fine. Well, it won't be fine. I've often been struck by the number of new Australians who tell me how much they love the country and believe in its values. Uh, and want to be part of it, and you have the distinct impression that they've transferred their primary loyalties to this culture at the very time that often this culture no longer believes in itself very much. Yep. The same is happening, obviously, in many places. Sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah. Another aside, uh, an Indigenous friend of mine made the observation that today uh, in a seminar that I was involved in, uh, that um, there are very good reasons why so many people wanted to come to Australia as a democracy and no one seems to want to leave. And, right. and uh, it was a very interesting comment in the context that it was made, a debate about about how best to advance Indigenous interests. But um, can I switch to your latest book, 
It deals with another political ideal that's uh, only a little less unpopular among many in our universities and media and intelligentsia, <laughs> and that's conservatism. Uh, again, I think it's best uh, maybe uh, to start by asking you, how would you describe what conservatism is, and by the way, what it's not? Now, that's a, that's a tough uh, gig, isn't it, given that we don't have all day and uh, well, maybe all week? <laughs> no, okay, but, you know, it's a, it's a fair question. If, if I write a book about something, then people, it's reasonable to ask me, you know, what, what, what's in it. Um, so so the, 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 the new conservatism book, uh, which, which is uh, uh, available in Australia, is um, uh, it, it, it's uh, structured to look at, at, at two different uh, Anglo um, ang Anglophone political traditions, conservatism and liberalism, and um, I, I, I go to a lot of trouble to to distinguish them both historically and also in terms of their their philosophical principles because for for various reasons they today they sometimes get confused. So they do. Uh, so. Uh, Look, if I'll try to make this very simple. If you are a person who um, who, who who believes, who assumes, or believes, or th that you have sufficiently understood what you need to understand about politics, if uh, your politics is, uh, if your your thought about politics is framed by uh, individual liberty. The, you know the the idea that everyone is by nature free, the individual equality, the idea that everybody is equal by nature, um, uh, the concept of uh, taking on moral and political obligations by consent, uh, the the the, the co if if your politics is framed by these concepts, um, individual liberty, individual equality, uh, moral obligation taken on 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 through consent. Uh, and I would say also the assumption that you know that all human beings are are reasonable, or most human beings are reasonable, and they they can all agree to these things. If that's your politics, you're a liberal. That that is the 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 classical traditional liberal framework. Of course, you know today we have progressive liberals and libertarians and classical liberals. There's all all sorts of liberals. What they all have in common is that that that's their that's their fundamental political worldview. Uh, individual liberty, individual equality, consent, reason—that's their worldview, and none of that is is uh, is necessarily conservative. Right? Conservatives are not like liberals. We don't we don't have a a universal political theory that uh, that is supposed to apply in all times and places. So there are different conservatisms in different country countries. But when we talk about um, uh, English conservatism, British conservatism, and its uh, variations in the uh, in the Anglosphere. That is a that's a particular conservative a conservative political tradition uh, that um, that uh, developed over you know more than a thousand years uh, uh, through through the common law tradition is rooted in uh, uh, the Bible and in in Christianity and I, I would say the best way to understand conservatism is to say that a conservative begins from a different place. A conservative says, I, I begin with my existing nation, my existing people, its existing traditions, the inheritance that it's developed over centuries. I begin with that and I ask, what do I need to do in order to, uh, in order to and make sure that it propagates through time, that my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren will benefit from the good aspects of this, this inheritance, and, and also that repairs will be introduced um, uh, so, so, so that it's improved in places where the system is running down, where, where we see injustice. That's a completely different starting point from the liberal starting point, because if you begin from asking, you know, here we are in, in Australia, we have an existing nation. There are many things that are good about it. How did it come to be? What what is it that makes the good things about Australia possible? And how can how can I contribute uh, as an individual or as a group or as a political figure, uh, a, a, or a religious figure or a business leader? How can I contribute to uh, maintaining to strengthening this this nation, 
to strengthening that inheritance so that it propagates. Okay, now obviously, uh, some of the, the 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 rights and liberties that that you know we associate with liber- liberalism, many of them, in fact, were originally de- developed as part of the political tradition and political inheritance um, of uh, of the English people and of of English speaking nations. Okay, so so part of the inheritance is, for example, I'm just to to take a an example that you probably people don't don't know but i think it's important um in uh, you can go back to um john fortescue was a was the uh, uh the, the leading common lawyer and chief justice uh in england at the end of the 1400s okay we're talking about 500 years ago uh, so you you would think oh so it must have been an incredibly barbaric and primitive time and you know people were unenlightened and they they didn't have liberalism but if you if you pick up um, in praise of the laws of England, Fortescue's sort of um, foundational pamphlet. Uh, it, it, it's you can say it's one of the founding, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, documents of of Anglo conservatism. If you pick it up, and and you can Cambridge has a beautiful edition. It's a short book. It's it, 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 they cleaned up the spelling. It's easy to read. Anyone can read it, although almost no one does. Anyone can read this book, and no, seriously, it's not taught in in university. It's not taught in political theory programs anywhere. I'm, which I, I th- quite believe you. I which, quite believe which, you. Which, which I I think is a grave mistake. Just buy it and pick it up and start reading, and you'll see that this this book is written in the 1400s, and he he starts talking about um, uh, the the separation of powers. Uh, the 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 balance balance of authorities between the king and parliament the 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 bicameral legislature the the responsibilities of the parliament for uh for for taxation and for for amendment of laws uh the the uh the responsibilities of the executive branch then he goes on to talk about uh uh, 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 uh about the relationship be- be- between uh, between property and liberty and he asks you know why is it that people uh, all over all over Europe know that that England has the uh, is the freest nation uh in, in all of Europe and he, he talks about you know the common law principle that the king is not allowed to enter the home of you know even you know even the poorest farmer without his permission much less take anything and he discusses the 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 iron connection between in pr- the protections of individual property and the freedom of individuals and of the society as a whole and he goes into the the the, the jury trial and i mean it, it's just it, it's like reading a, a, a much of it is like reading a a primer for uh modern political theory except that it's it's rooted in scripture and the common law they, they haven't yet erased the biblical and common law inheritance which which leads to all of these um, theories of how how freedom works and what it's for and 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 how you preserve it, and so so the um, um, the, the <laughs> we were talking about conservatism and I got carried away a little bit. So look, the the difference between the liberals and the conservatives, in short, uh, is is that conservatives are looking to understand the tradition that they have inherited and that allows them to keep their country strong and make it stronger. Uh, as you said at the beginning, their conservatives are somewheres. They're thinking about their place and their community and how to strengthen it. And liberals are anywheres. They have an abstract theory that they claim can can be understood through reason by anyone in Afghanistan and anyone in Iraq and anyone anywhere who hears liberal principles will simply say that's right. And if they don't say that's right because they have their own traditions, then the liberals say, look, you're primitive. We'll have to force you. Well, that's very valuable. Uh, we've now reached a point where a lot of cynics say, well, the problem for conservatives now is there's nothing left to conserve. Right. Look at the mess our governance arrangements are in. Uh, the lack of um, investment, really, uh, on the part of younger people in democratic capitalism. Look at the state of the family, the universities, the media, churches, religious denominations. They're all pretty decayed. What's left to conserve? What can conservatism offer? Well, look, to be sure, this question is the right question to be asking now. And um, uh, uh, young people especially, you know, who... who, um, uh, who grew up feeling that 
they haven't really inherited anything good. There's, I mean, there's many, many, many young people like that. And uh, uh, it's a it's a little bit o- harder for older people to to admit this or ask this question. But I think I think the young people are right. I think that that, that so much has been destroyed. God and scripture, um, nation and family, the sacred, the the uh, the honorable. Um, and now even even the distinction between man and woman. I mean, uh, look, the, the the cultural revolution is capable of destroying absolutely everything, and and it will destroy everything. And uh, and so at this point, I think um, it, in in this book, I make um, my conser- the new conservatism book. I make two arguments. Um, one has to do with with the national sort of the the public level, and one has to do with our personal lives. The argument at the public level is that um, that at at this moment, it, it, what conservatives more than anything need um, when talking about uh, sort of high politics, the politics of, of of countries and states and things, what we need more than anything else is examples of successful conservative uh, government. Um, that that can be, you know, in different countries, um, or it can be in, uh, in in you know in in subdivisions like uh, uh, states of a federation. Uh, in I, I don't know Australia so well, but you know, in the United States, that there there are many states where there still is a majority that is um, that is sufficiently conservative, so that a, an alliance could be built to say, look, we we we've we've had enough of. Of liberal democracy, we want conservative democracy. We want a, a democracy that uh, focuses on uh, preservation and restoration, um, and, uh, uh, and 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 therefore can serve as a model for others uh, how uh, of how things might be done. So that's a that's an argument about you know kind of about the national level, recognizing that there are subdivisions. Where conservatism is still possible as a public philosophy, but conservatives have to be willing to do it. They have to be willing to uh, to take political risks in order to uh, to have more conservative government where it's feasible uh, democratically. The other part of the argument has to do with the personal lives of you know of anyone picking up the book or anyone. Uh, thinking about uh, this question of how, how can we achieve restoration uh, at the personal level, the, the the problem is some in in many ways more severe because young people will say, "Look, it's all very fine to talk about you know the traditional family, but I didn't grow up in a traditional family. My I, you know I I grew up in a broken family, and um, I uh, it's fine to talk about." Uh, the benefits of congregational life, but I didn't grow up in a congregation. I don't believe in any religion. I don't. I. I. I don't know how to do any of those things. And um, when when we're facing this uh, issue of of liberalism at the personal level, of uh, people leading a liberal life, and many people coming to recognize that you know that this that 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 this liberal life of freedom and equality and consent and nothing else you know just those things alone w- well we can see in every democratic society we see where that leads within within two generations you know si- since world war ii two generations three at the most where does it lead it, it leads to the point where a young man and a young woman who want to marry and to stay married aren't able to do so everybody's scared to get married if they do get married, they don't know how to make a marriage work, so they end up getting divorced. If they they're scared, too scared to have children, so the so so the uh, the, the the fertility rate drops, and you know with with devastating consequences both personally and nationally. Um, and and this is it: hesitation and and fear and confusion is the the ultimate end of being raised in a liberal philosophy, and what. What I've uh, urged people to do, although I, I know that for some people this is easier and for some people this is very difficult, but the the important thing to understand, the key to the whole issue is to understand that human beings are only, they're only happy and healthy 
psychologically and physically. They're only happy and healthy when they have a place, uh, a, a, an appropriate fitting place within a human hierarchy to which they are loyal and that they respect. Now, I'm not talking at this point about the nation. I'm talking at, at, at first about the way that families and congregations, which is an alliance of families, how they work. Uh, and 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 you know pe people like um, uh, Jordan Peterson or Abigail Schreier, um, the, there are, are various people who've been writing about this subject. About the it, it actually goes back to Emil Durkheim, the uh, the the great sociologist, who wrote a book on suicide, uh, in which he asked he tried to understand why suicide rates are higher um, in his in his time and place among Protestants than among Catholics and Jews. And he proposed this. He proposed this this view. He said, "Look, the problem is that that our Protestants have not kept a hierarchical structure in which the children grow up as part as as part of a family, and the family is part of a congregation, and the car congregation is part of a, a a larger religious framework. And children growing up in that kind of a hierarchical social structure, Durkheim argued, they they don't have problems with you know with freeing themselves from things that they don't like but the the advantage in such a structure is that there is a path that has been developed over many generations that allows young people to begin you know kind of at, at the bottom of society as infants not knowing how to do anything and to gradually rise in honor and public respectability and self-respect and self-esteem knowing how to do things knowing how to get things done knowing how to cause people around them to uh, to respect them and that is something that no individual no free individual no bunch of individuals exercising their freedom is capable of inventing that by themselves okay so so if if you're a young person and you're feeling what durkheim called anomie the 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 aimlessness, the despair, the depression of not knowing a direction, not being able to invent a direction for yourself. You know, Nietzsche thought that people you know would be able to invent directions for themselves. It, it turns out almost nobody can do that. So the first step to health is to go to a local congregation. Okay, and this can be uh, Catholic or Protestant or Orthodox Christian or Jewish. These are very different. These are very different religions, and there are other religions that, that that are also even more different. They're different from one another. Each one is different. But what what a functioning traditional congregation can offer you is uh, adults, married couples um, who have raised, who have stayed together for for their whole lives, who have raised children, sometimes many children, who know how it's done. And you can uh, join and begin participating. You don't have to begin as a believer because you don't understand what they're doing. You just you have to you don't have to believe anything. You just have to say, "I am coming here to learn." You have to give honor to 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 those people who have succeeded in keeping marriages together their whole lives, who have raised children, who have created a flourishing community, who know how it's done. You need to go and participate, and through that participation, through giving honor to people who have achieved something, you yourself then begin the process of learning how it's done. You become a part of the, the chain of transmission and you start to learn how you can also lead a conservative life, not a liberal life, a life that's about conservation and transmission to future generations. And I, 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 I in the book, I, I, um, I did something I've never done before. I, I included a, a personal chapter about myself and and uh, my wife Yael. The reason I did this is because, you know, I'm, I'm telling people how they should live, and I I, I started to feel that it that um, if I don't tell my story, then people will you'll th you know say who is this guy? You know, he's making it up. And so, um, although it's very personal, the 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 point of that last chapter of the book is that. This is what my wife and I did. This is what many of our friends in university did together with us. This is what tens of thousands of people, you know, have have 
have done always, you know, in in our generation and previous generations, uh, the the uh, the return to a traditional life, it is uh, it is possible, it is doable, it looks daunting, but take the first step and be patient. It works. It brings health and sanity to the individual, and once these communities are strong enough and self-confident enough, they will be able to have a, a very great influence also at, you know, at the regional level, at the local level, and then ultimately at the national level. You've given us a great deal to think about. You've been very generous with your time. You've plainly thought about these things a great deal. And I have the strong impression that there's no disconnect between what you say and what you do. Uh, which, of course, is such a common problem today. Uh, people feel the hypocrisy of a lot of those who, who want to point to a better way because they don't live consistently with what they say. But your book, uh, Conservatism, A Rediscovery, uh, is something that I strongly recommend. Uh, and um, again, uh, I can only thank you very much for your, uh, your generosity with your time. Sure. Thank, thank you for having me. And God, God bless you. Thank you and you. Take care.